The McLaren 12C, it's over a decade old now and is still blisteringly fast, offers you one of the most practical and comfortable of supercars and the design we think has really stood the test of time. But is it going to cost you the earth to run and live with? And crucially, is it going to be as exciting as one of the other supercars of that era? Well, to answer those questions, we're off to meet John Thorne from Thorny Motorsport to find out all the answers. Hi, John. How are you doing, hey? Very well, thank you. Very well. Well, thanks very much for having us here at Thorny today to look at this magnificent 12C in the McLaren Orange. It looks absolutely brilliant. Well, thanks for bringing the sunshine. They do, they do, they do pop in the sunshine, the McLaren Orange cars, for sure. It really does. And we wanted to, we want to come down to you to speak to a McLaren specialist. And the obvious place to start was the 12C. And these are now getting a lot of attention and, and just coming and seeing this for the first time here today, I've sort of taken it back at how how fresh it looks given that it's about 12 years old now. Well, we, we've got we've got 38 McLarens on site here at the moment. So I figure we picked the earliest one to look at from a 12C's perspective. So this is what we would consider almost a classic McLaren. It's yeah. such as a 2011 plate uh, coupe, yeah. one of the launch edition colors. This is McLaren orange yeah. uh, with black wheels and a silver interior. There were specific cars that when they launched the car with, this is one of them. So we thought start with the earliest car you've got. Perfect. Um, to, uh, something to look at for the start of the model. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and what we want to do today is really sort of get into um, this is one of our buyer's guides, so really sort of telling people what they should look out for. But I suppose I want to get into, first of all, is, look, if I was going to buy one of these, is it going to cost me the earth to run? Is it going to be more temperamental than any other supercar of this era, of this kind of bracket? I must have 10 phone calls a day from people who read the internet and Facebook and all kinds of groups and, and the reputation of the car is so bad, getting better, but has been so bad that majority of my time is saying, ignore what you read online. <laughs> there are problem cars, I call cars, and there are problem issues you can avoid. But as a basic car and a car going forward, they are not expensive to maintain. Yeah. They are not expensive to run. They are not expensive to run in terms of a, a supercar generally, let alone a, a normal car in terms of generally not expensive. But you need to be aware of the pitfalls because the pitfalls can be quite expensive to fix if you find yourself in one. Yeah, and of course there'll be some people that are sort of stretching themselves into getting into those cars and then not actually understanding what the sort of the maintenance journey is like. Well, the, the, the couple of things we said to people, we've done, a, we've, we've run our own warranty here, so we crunch a lot of data in terms of what goes wrong, doesn't wrong, have done for the last 10 years since it's been going in terms of McLaren side. We bought our first car uh, 11, uh, 10 years ago. Um, and what we say to people is generally speaking, doesn't matter what model of McLaren you've got, if you budget for four and a half thousand pounds of servicing over a three year period, that'll cover everything from a 12C up to including a 720. Yeah. And that includes brake pads and bits like that. So it's in terms of general service now, it'll be a cost base. But in terms of the, the, the cars, there was a period of time probably two years ago where they plummeted. They really came down in price, yeah. uh, especially 12Cs. You know, we know one car that was sold for 46,000 pounds. Wow, that's low, isn't um, it? Well, it was 46,000 pounds, it needed 25,000 pounds of work on it, so not quite a full <laughs> okay. car. All but right. it did get down to 60 odd thousand. And the problem that you had is that people bought these cars at 60, 70,000. And then they looked at the parts prices and they were a bit stunned about how much a lower arm was, how much of things were. Yeah. You try to point out that these weren't 70,000 pounds car new, they were 250,000 pounds new. Yeah. Now McLaren, you know, they, 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 they control parts prices. So when looked at people part prices, you've got to understand it wasn't a 70,000 pound car, it was quarter million. Therefore parts prices as a result are relatively expensive compared to that kind of buy-in. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about you know, what I'm buying then. If I buy, it, buy a 12C, what am I really getting into? What, tell me a little bit about the characteristics of this car. Well, the, the thing about McLaren is that the, the, the two things it's best at is one is its technology and second is its chassis and dynamics. Um, if I told you that there are other supercar manufacturers who look at the 12C and they still can't replicate the active dynamic suspension, they still can't really replicate the active aero, and it's a 10-year-old car, and these guys are in awe of this thing from 10 years ago. The technology that McLaren has is its, is, its, is its USP, it's its perfect sales position. The second thing is the handling side of it. Um, now, this is a super serious car, so this has the active aero and active suspension. You speak to anybody, there's no way you can have a car that has such a comfortable ride 
at the same time such a huge sporty handling position in one car. Yeah, and that, that, that's, his real, that's his real benefit it's got. The downside to it is, uh, and one of the reasons why we got into McLaren work, is that this reputation of being a technological, wonderful thing put people off. Yeah. And it puts a lot of people off. They're looking at it and can I work on these cars? So we specifically started on it, realizing that people said, oh, you can't work on those. Yeah, you can. Just this requires effort and effort. Hence, we bought our own 12C to start us off. Is that what attracted to you, the sort of the technological aspect that, that they were sort of really pushing things onwards? Well, I mean, there were three reasons why we got involved in our history. We've been going 25 years. So we have a lot of history in BMW and in Vauxhall and in motorsport and racing. And I, I wanted a McLaren. I'll be brutally honest. As a selfish person, I wanted a supercar. And I'd had my time driving Astros and M3s. I wanted something special. <laughs> Always love the McLarens. Uh, I wanted something British, which, you know, and they are patriotic at heart. It's a yeah. British car. And thirdly, I wanted something different. I mean, you could, I could, I mean, we're in this Silverstone here, so I can pick up a stick and hit three or four Porsche tuners from here and yeah. all better than I am. Yeah. Ditto and Lamborghini. Whereas no one was doing McLaren and uh, no one even started it because the reputation was you couldn't be done. And I thought, you know what? If someone says I can't do something, I tend to have a reaction, I'll prove them wrong. Yeah. And yeah, it did take some time. We owned our 12C for nearly four years before we even started doing certain wow, customers' so really, cars. Really it took a that. long time to get yeah. under the car. Um, the other benefit behind it is that we have a good reputation of Vauxhall VX220s. We became the official company for Vauxhall for them. Yeah. And uh, when we first got our 12C, we put it in a ramp next to a VX220 that was being uh, having a lot of refurb work on it. And the similarities to the VX220 and the McLaren are almost embarrassing. The way that the subframe attaches to the chassis. Um, whilst there are different materials, you're going from aluminium to carbon fiber and steel to aluminium, but the way they're built and constructed and the whole process design is very, very similar. And the right. reason why is that there's a 12-man team who designed the original 12C, 650s and McLaren. Nine are ex-Lotus. <laughs> wow. So yeah. for us, we didn't really start the 12C in a slow level. We were already running because we'd already been racing VX running for 10 years, yeah. uh, seven years. So for us, we got into the 12C and we thought, this is just, this is heaven. Because if we've already done a lot of this already, yeah. we don't need to worry about actually what we learn. And also we did lots of issues. McLaren aren't the easiest company to deal with sometimes, especially independents like us. Um, but you get through those things. We had to design our own diagnostic kit, we have to do our own warranty, our own process behind it. But the last 10 years of doing it, uh, we, we've got to know them pretty well, and, and they, are, they are great cars, but you have to look th through that reputation, and that's the issue you've got. What are some of your favourite things um, specifically about the 12C? Ah. I mean, just standing here looking at it now, I mean, quite obvious with, with these doors, I mean, they've got to be one of the highlights of it for I think for the, the, there's several things about the, the 12C specifically I like. It's, first of all, it's its curves. I mean, mm. it really is quite a classic shape. I mean, yeah. they changed a bit the 650 in the front end, but the way the design of the thing, it's very smooth. There's no, it's very different Lamborghini. Lamborghini like to bolt things on, you know, yeah. winglets and, and vents and all kinds of stuff. You don't need that with McLaren. Yeah. The airflow is very much driven around the car into the back and it, it is a, nicely done. The dihedral doors are great. I mean, and for the super serious cars, we have never had to replace a door hitch ever yeah. in 10 years. They, they are, are, they are engineering clever. excellence in that regard. And the final thing is, I mean, the main thing for me is, is the handling. I mean, that, that handling of the car. Um, I've had Lamborghinis and 911s before, and they both have their own attributes. But in terms of 12C specifically, it's a lovely, comfortable drive, but also when you want to push on, it is great fun, and you yeah. can really exploit the chassis. Just to see the other side of that then, what, the, what are the things that you've discovered over your time working on these cars, which are slight sort of niggles that you've, you sort of look to sort of iron out? Um, well, the one niggle I'm, I'm on record with saying is the in-car entertainment, the sat-nav system, it's, it's, it's garbage. I mean, I, I won't even be nice to say garbage. It is the worst thing known to man. <laughs> I've got a picture somewhere on my wall where I wanted to go from here to Birmingham, and yeah. it took me via Lincoln. Right. I mean, it really was a, Helpful. A, a really terrible. And, and you won't fix that. Yeah. Um, there, there's a ways you can, but there, that's pretty terrible. Um, the, the reputation is the worst thing about it. Yeah. it, it, it about the car itself, there are niggles. Um, you know, there are various engine issues you've got to be aware of, but they're rare, ditto gearboxes, ditto wear and tear items. Yeah. But in terms of me, the, the worst thing about the car is the reputation it has, which I don't think it's deserved. Not warranted. Yeah, no, I, I, and as, we're, as we're about to discover, there, there is so much packed, packed into this. So 
let's kind of let's have a little walk around the car then and let's sort of discover it as we go front to back and and talk us through some of the things that you'd be talking to me as a, as a customer or, or a friend if I was looking to buy one of these what where, what are the, where would we start the fir first things first is that values of these cars especially are determined by the specification yeah okay we're not worried about mileage per se they can be a daily car all in all out it does affect money for lots of people but generally speaking mileages are not too much an issue they have big services at 20,000 and 40,000 miles. Other than that, they're 600 pounds a year, not expensive. But looking at a car, the first thing for is how much carbon fiber does it have? Right. It doesn't really rate the value of the car, but it's something, that, as an example, people look for. So for example, in this particular car, this is a launch edition car, so it's got very limited carbon fiber on it. They, the carbon wasn't available when they first came through. Yeah. So it's got things like, it's got a standard plastic front splitter at the bottom there, which would be yeah. carbon fiber here. So that's something people look for. Ditto in terms of the sides. You've got the air brakes at the sides. Now these are carbon fiber. So they can be color coded, yes, or they can be carbon fiber. That's a, a sell point. Yeah. Ditto the arch liners at the top. Again, that's a plastic one. This one, they can be carbon fiber. And ditto on the back, you've got things like air brakes, and you've got rear diffusers. In this example, they're both color coordinated. You can those in carbon fiber as well. So if I said to you, as an option, a carbon fiber air brake was nine thousand pounds, you can see how it affects the value of the car long term. Yes. I don't think you get the value back, but it means it becomes more sellable or not. Yeah. Um, the second thing we're looking for in terms of super serious car, 12C specifically, is that there is a reasonably well-known example of have what, we, what we call it corrosion, but it's not technically corrosion, bubbling paint. Right. Uh, all McLarens are affected depending on what model and what type. But for the 12C, um, the bubbling is actually uh, inside the laminate of the fiberglass of the composite. Right. And it's basically water vapor building up inside the laminate and expanding and then causing the paint to bubble. Are there areas in particular that you see that more than more than others? Well, particularly on 12Cs, the one, the one things we tend to see them more are um, certainly around the front leading edges of the arches on the wheel arch liners. So you run your finger down the side of the arch liner. If it feels bubbly, it's bubbling paint. Yeah. Just on the front end of the front wing, on the front wings as well, and also the inside of the door edges down the bottom on the inside. Yeah. The other common place where they go on 12Cs specifically is on the inside of the bonnet up here. Yeah. So you can just feel your finger across it and you'll feel it bubbly. Now, it used to be that McLaren would cover this under warranty. Yeah. They don't anymore. So we've been doing paint for 10 years. We never release it to customers because we thought McLaren would pay for it. Yeah. So the moment McLaren said the 10 year warranty is drawn to five year warranty, technically they've not changed it, but we'll speak to lawyers about that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it means it's all fixable. I mean, what you do is you basically prep down to get the bubbling out, rebuild it up and repaint it. It's very fixable to get done. It's not cheap to get done, but it's no. not, not mad money compared to what you have sometimes. So 12C is really leading edges of the arch liners, bonnets, burr part the doors, other models bubble in different areas. So it's knowing which can you do. But a very simple inspection, run your finger under the wheel arches. That's that, these that, least what we do. Yeah. Um, this particular car did have some bubbling arches. Now it's painted and you see, it, paint, it color matches really nicely. Yeah, no, it looks, looks perfect. So, but mechanically, um, we always say to people, if you can, get it inspected either straight after you bought it or prior to if you can. Um, they don't have major problems, but the problems that they have in our experience now is that said they were bought quite cheaply and means they haven't been serviced very well. Yeah. Or with a skill or knowledge. For example, we've seen you know, some dealers have these cars in, they don't know how to service them. So they're, you know, the, the butts are wiped and off they go. And what we have found in these cars is that um, getting on top of little niggly problems makes them quite cheap to fix. For example, you can get some hoses that will leak off, etc. Okay, replace those clips straight away, problem gone. Ignore them, you're looking at your radiators. So it becomes a small problem ignored because of a big bill. Yeah. And that's where it comes from. So we do a hose clip replacement on these cars, which because all the hose clips, um, McLaren spec, is really cheap clips, they're just, just snapped. Yeah. And you had multiple coolant leaks. And of course, if you have a coolant leak, it beaches the car. So the first thing we did was come up with our own 18 clip motorsport clamp clip, yeah. um, which I need 50 quid, and you fit all those things, and then you completely problem free. Yeah. So things like that to look for is the answer. Um, and then things like gearboxes, you can, there was a period of time where gearboxes would leak, and again, the McLaren dealer mentality was replace the gearbox, <laughs> 17,000 pounds. So we rebuilt them. Uh, ditto, um, the other thing you can see on 12Cs specifically is cracked heads. It's very rare, um, but McLaren again would say brand new engine, 50,000 quid, or you rebuild it for 10. So these are big bills, but a lot less than it would be in terms of going from official dealer in terms of choice behind it. And the other thing is things called cam phases. So these cars all have dry sumps, oil dry sumps. So you don't have a dipstick. So the process by which checking your oil is on the dash. And you'd be amazed how many people don't do it. Okay, I, my view of life is you just own a car, you check your oil every, every couple of weeks. And also you sat in the dash, you have to sit there holding the foot down the pedal and everything else is there. It can be a pain. 
but you need to be careful on these and making sure the oil level is maintained. If you run them very low oil, or if you run them hard when they're cold, which obviously no good petrol head would do anyway, um, you do run the position of damaging the cam phases, which is the basic variable valve timing gears on the engine. They can be replaced now, but you're still looking at 10,000 pounds if it does it. So a way of, uh, the only way of sort of knowing that then presumably is through looking through its service or, or the pre-inspection. Pre Things like cam phases, you can by starting the car up. Start the car up, you'll have a bit of a tappity noise. Yeah. Um, they have a bit of a, a, a vibration. Once that calms down, then fine. If that carries on on cold start, it does suggest there's probably going to be cam phase. It doesn't mean it's in was, but it needs further investigation. Things like gearboxes, you're looking for a leak. There's a telltale hole in the bottom, um, which if it leaks all from that point, it's just an issue. There are breathers on the gearbox as well, so they leak down the sides. Breathers supposed to do that. Some 12Cs have catch tanks, some don't. There's no way of knowing. For example, my own personal 12C didn't have a catch tank. We had either chassis number in the workshop on the ramp, either side of it. Catch tank, no catch tank, catch tank. There was no rhyme or reason, so there's no way of knowing. You can see by looking at it. So those things are worth carefully. The downside you got is this isn't the sort of thing you can do without going on a ramp. All the other trays off, the fuse are off, it's half hour to get to it all. Yeah. Then you can see everything. Otherwise than that, you've got a flat floor car, you can't see where these things are because all protected and covered up. So basically, it's, I mean, we can, for us to do an inspection, it's three hours worth of work. So it's actually inspected all from there. And um, fortunately, as time goes on, we're going away, we're now seeing less of those oh my god cars and more of that this car's fine, which is good because means they're being worked on and people are seeing the issues and, and, and fixing them. The downside of the 12C was that most of the problems came about from build. And you had to go through a process of fixing the niggles together. Once you've got a car that's been in through, through a few hands, even dealers are independents getting the problems fixed, they're very reliable. Yeah. I mean, they're really very reliable. Just you, keeping on top of that maintenance after that, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, should we have a walk around the side and um, I mean, this had very sophisticated suspension setup, didn't it? So This is active aero. So this has one, they don't have anti-roll bars. Normally yes. a suspension is a suspension with a roll bar that controls roll the car. Yeah. They don't have roll bars at all. They technically have a sway bar, but it's not quite the same thing. Yeah. So the damping system both controls both the compression and the rebound on two different systems. Yeah. Uh, and that's interlinked in with the traction control and together with the dynamic suspension system itself. So. It means on a, on a comfort mode, which is what these technically had, you have a, a lot more movement suspension and much more comfortable in terms of ride. Going to sport or track mode, it goes much, much stiffer. Yep. Now, the downside too is they have a thing called accumulators. Now, accumulator is basically a little metal bulb uh, and it acts as a, as, a, as a pressure balance on the suspension. Um, it's less for 12Cs, more for 650s, but if those fail, you lose that adaptability. Now, it's very easy to tell. You basically drive the car in comfort mode, go over bumpy road, then switch it over to track mode. It should feel a lot stiffer. If it doesn't feel any different, chance of accumulators are gone and you're replacing. But they can be replaced, and, and once they're replaced once, they don't replace them again. Yeah. Um, so things like that are worth noting on the suspension side of it. If the car feels really good, it's probably fine. Yeah. If the car feels crashy in comfort mode, it would need investigating. Yeah, because these are well known for being you know, really comfortable cruisers. They, 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 they look like they'd have a really harsh ride, don't they? But actually... it's, it's absurd. I, I, we had a couple of people who are ex-Lotus drivers come and go to buy cars. And, and their view was, oh, I'm a bit concerned. That, you know, and they drive it in comfort mode, and they can't, can't believe this car. It's better than my Merc. It really yeah. is a Mercedes S-Class supercar. But put it in a sport or track mode, it's straight into full full race mode. Proper animal. The other thing we find with this is geometries. It's a double A, a, double a wishbone suspension all round, which is great for adjustability and handling, but it's very easy to get knocked out. And our wonderful roads in the country, they get knocked out repeatedly. If I said you've never had a car come in here that was straight, that would be about right. <laughs> so they do the geometry checking every year, we think, and they need yeah. adjusting. So you'll see some strange tire wear you get. Again, it's down to geometries. You won't feel it super per se, but the car is much better once handling being yeah. done. So things, things like clips, oil, geometry, they're things that you want, you want to be able to be, be seeing it that they've been looked at, yeah. serviced every every year if if needs to be. You'd be amazed. We have cars we've that, that have come in here that have been serviced at dealers for six, seven years. They've never geometry checked. And I'm saying it's a quarter imbalance supercar. At least ch check it. Yeah. Um, uh, but the little things, for example, all 12 Cs come on steel brakes. You could specify carbon ceramics. Um, now, McLaren's carbon ceramics are not as good as Porsche's. Okay, right. Porsche's is quite a long way advanced than McLaren. Uh, they're very good in terms of on road. They don't last so well on track. So the 12 Cs all came with steels. Now, steel brakes are brilliant. I mean, we rarely replace them. Um, they, they last 50, 60,000 miles. Track work takes more Depends hours. Depends on how you drive it, of course. It does, yeah. of course, does, yeah. <laughs> but they're very reliable to the process. So in this particular car, it's got color matched calipers. Again, that was a unique launch type process. Yeah. But their steels themselves are very, a very good set of brakes. And again, very reliable. Yeah. Um, 
So in terms of the, the handling side of it, you know, check your suspension, check your accumulators, you know, geometries. Not really much else needs to be concerned about. But you do get wear into items for Z bar links, for example. It's a bush, they wear out. Um, due to in terms of upper and, lower, upper and lower bushes. Yeah. So if you have a squeak, for example, on the front, it'll be, an, it'll be a, a, a top upper A-arm bush. If you get a clonk, it'll be a lower A-arm bush. It's just knowledge these cars. Well, we can drive a car and we know exactly what's wrong with it because we've done it 100 times before. Yeah. So, so a road test for us, we can normally determine, and I on average road test between 10 and 15 McLarens a week. Yeah. Um, I think I'm up to nearly 2,000 cars driven now, which yeah. is a bit so mad, can, really. You can tell very quickly um, then, can't you? Yeah, it's that thing, thing to look for that kind of thing if you can. Yeah. Um, you rarely get a real, you know, nail, frankly. We do yeah. see them. Yeah. And they come in, everything's leaking, you know, and, and yeah. there's things falling off them. And sadly, that's the rarity. The downside is that if someone's bought a car for 65,000 pounds, we immediately know it's got 10 grand of work on it. Absolutely guaranteed. Because right. it just don't exist in that sort of pricing structure. But it's nice to know, you know, because 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 you know when you read about the cars, there's so there's so much to love about them, um, and then yet you hear all the all of the nonsense on on social media about you know McLarens being unreliable, this that this that and the other. And I'm sure there is there you know there are there are documented cases that of course, um, but it's nice to know you know speaking to an expert who's been around in these a lot of the time that you know they are relatively easy to live with. I think McLaren's big problem is that as a manufacturer, it is very arrogant and its dealers have taken that to new degrees. Yeah. Um, it is a difficult company to work with in terms of the reputation. The whole market knows this. And for, for us being independent, we look at the car. We look yeah. at it from bumper to bumper. We don't care about the politics and anything else that comes down from it. And the cars themselves are significantly better than the reputation they've been given. But the reputation they have is partly being generated by how we look at it. For example, we have customers come in, they say, oh, I had a 12C, I did 100,000 pounds of warranty claims on it. I had three gearboxes. Wow. You know what, we look at that, there's no way you've done three gearboxes. That yeah. means there are one gearbox gone and two more that may well not need to be done, but somebody got billed for it. Somebody got billed for but it. But that yeah. means the result is that gentleman has a car, had three gearboxes. Just because that was their, that was, that was their default, that well, we'll just get rid of this Correct. and move yeah, on. And, uh, so it, do you it's not the case. So do you think, you know, Generally speaking, then, because of the time that's elapsed from when these were first launched, that the 12C is probably, uh, you know, a little bit more reliable now than some of the some of the newer cars. Because actually, you've worked out all of the gremlins on this, and yet some of the newer newer models they're still to be weeded through. Or I know it's it's a r romantic way of looking at it, and and the funding is not the case. Mm. Okay, there is no more reliable McLaren over another. I mean, they really, they have different issues. For example, you know, 720, give an example. So 720 to a sale, the two extremes, they're both super serious cars. The 12C has problems that are fixable and you can see, so the 720. They don't actually have the same problems. They really don't. I mean, there's some commonality, obviously, because they share the same gearbox and share the same engine. Well, not the 720, it's four litre, but in terms of overall, there are similarities. They don't have the same issues. So they all have their own, own personal issues. But so I, I get this conversation every day, which is the cheapest car to run? And I've said, you get a nice car, the 720 will cost the same amount to run as a 12C. Yeah. You get a difficult car, then the yeah. number's going to add up. It's, it, so there really isn't a, a more reliable car. No. But you're right, in terms of a 12C, I don't remember last time there was a problem we hadn't seen before. Yeah. A, a unique, where did this come from? Yeah. Well, that's great, because then you, you, you know, it gives comfort when you're going into something like that, spending the kind of money that, that these cost now, knowing that, that, that there are fixes, that you're not going to find yourself with a car which can't, can't be salvaged if there's a if there's a problem that hasn't been addressed. It's down to experience. We had a car come in on a flatbed from our dealer. The concern was what was wrong with it. They started the car on the flatbed. Myself and my technicians both said drop valve straight away. Yeah. And this guy said, well, look, this guy's had the car for two weeks. He can't figure it out. We said, it's a drop valve. You can tell it's a drop valve. It's a certain tone these make when they drop a valve and engine it. And uh, lo and behold, drop valve. And, uh, and the guy said, yeah, I can't believe that. You diagnose it in five seconds. And I said, look, we've done three or four before. We know what it sounds like. So fortunately, it's a rare issue. Um, but it's rebuildable. The downside you have is that the engine work, majority of places replace the engine. Well, like I said they're 48,000 pounds plus for that. Um, you know, that, we, there's got to be an awful lot of work to do for me to do that. Yeah. Um, we can rebuild everything. But it's experience, as you say. Let's, move, let's carry on moving then. And uh, we, we come to the, the, the wonderful doors that really add, add the theatre. Of course, the car got a bit of a knock for looking fairly plain when it came out, but it doesn't look pl plain at all to me. And these, these just look absolutely brilliant. They're quite... Um, well, they're brilliantly engineered, actually, because you, you, you showed me earlier on just how you open the door, and that's simply by sort of swiping, Can you do it? swiping your hand underneath it. Oh, there we go. Oh, <laughs> now I've buggered it up now. <laughs> we'll close that down. Hang on. Let's try that again. 
Oh, it has it. Did, did it actually? Almost. Oh, is it? There we go. It's a neck. <laughs> but there's nothing there. If you have a look, there's, there's actually, there's no handle there at all. So that's all done just by swiping a hand under there. There's obviously... We're a big fan of the swipe doors. So this is one of the, the classic ones where swipe doors are the early models only. Yeah. They got replaced with a button uh, quite into the, into the late in the coupes and into the spiders and in 650s. And we've never had to replace this mechanism. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason for changing it is down to people getting dirty fingertips. That was what it was stopped for. But it's great because, I um, mean, this particular car, they did, cars did come with a sticker on the window how to do it. This particular owner's taken it off. Taken off, off. yeah. So you can't tell what's there. So I it's simply would. down to a, a swipe. <laughs> there we are. Won't do it me now. There we are. And so no doubt. So they're great. I mean, as it's a door, cool. I mean, there's, there's also not a huge amount of room. So in the garage position, we've got we have our, our car parking here three meter bay so both cars open both doors up yes. so it's slightly wider but it's yeah. not a huge it's not like a Lamborghini which can be quite a lot of height yeah. or a Konus egg which is height and width <laughs> I mean it's going to be you know it's, it's going to might cause you a bit of trouble at Tesco's but um, otherwise they're, they're, they're very good and again and, we've and never had to replace a door hinge on I was, a super I was going serious to say car about ever. hinges and you know, how, how reliable are they or you know because there is a very complicated design um, you'd expect that you might have heard of some some trouble with those. Well, sports series cars do have a cracked hinge issue, and they're later model cars. Um, but on the super series car, we've never done one ever, yeah. um, and they're and they're solid, and they do get a slam. I mean, this this car does have soft close those doors fitted. It didn't come, yeah. but to shut the door without soft close was a proper slam. Yeah. So you can see where issues come from it. So we do a lot of soft close retrofits, 12Cs, okay. where they actually some you know, they came standard in 650s and obviously sports series. But 12C was good old slam doors. Yeah. You did sometimes get issues with the, the dashes inside the, the doors for the air con would break because they just got constant repetitive hit. Um, so soft close is quite a common fit for these things. Um, it's magnificent just to see that, that, that uninterrupted line, isn't it? Because you see these sort of beautiful Italian uh, supercars, Ferraris, and you think, oh, such a shame, you know, they've got that. Well, it's, it's worth looking at in as much. We do a lot of uh, tuning on these cars, obviously, um, with, um, and we have our own dyno here, and it's all about airflow. And um, we have a four fan dyno system, so two at the front, two extracting. We only need to run one fan front in the middle because the, 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 sacrificial, the, the parasitic airflow comes down, sucks through into the air takes, and obviously cools the engine. We never run these at high temperatures. It's, we just don't need to. Yeah. You know, I could put a VX220 in there, for example, and cook it within 30 seconds. But put these ones or a 720 or any of the sports or any of the McLarens, frankly, their skill in taking that cold airflow and ramming it into the engine to keep the engine cool is just sublime. It's a yeah. huge difference. And these are quite small air intakes. If you look at the 720, they take uh, airflow from the eyes, from the, from the lights. Yeah. So very clever they do it. So, that, so it's a very smooth line, but it does a perfect job for it. It's the engineering side where it gets us excited about McLaren. So Yeah, and of course, here is, is our, our sort of carbon tub, and that was, that was quite a quite a thing to have. I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like Vauxhall were, what, Vauxhall and Lotus were, were there first, but... Um, well, no, Vauxhall made a nice aluminium tub. I think yeah. McLaren just said, like, throw his aluminium crap oh, away, let's put carbon, carbon fibre on it. Yeah. But then the, their Formula 1 te technical skill is a lot higher. So, yeah. uh, and it, the, the tub itself, I mean, we, we did have one here on display in the showroom for a while, um, and it, the design is, is minimal. Like, they've yeah. done the very smallest amount of design work to get the best attribute from it. Yeah. Sometimes with designs, the simpler they are, the more natural they work. And, and the, the 12C is an example of that. Arguably, as McLaren's gone on its design, they've, they've been a bit more complicated, you know, start adding, tweaking things there or thereabouts. So the natural design they had was, was the 12C. The 650 changed the bumper and a few little changes. Also, Sports is completely different, and 720 again with error again. But in terms of the, the classic, uh, you know, um, design for, desi for, for function, uh, the 12C, I think, probably represents the best a lot. Best a lot. And of course, that... that that tub then affects how the, the layout is on, on the inside. So you, you've got these quite large sills to climb over and then you've got that s sort of slightly narrower cabin. You sit in the car. It still, still does feel... The Sports Series is a slightly narrower tub. So the Sports Series is, well, the tub's the same, but they've basically sculpted out the sides. So there's a yeah. bigger access for it. Yeah. Um, what's crucial about it is when people come to look at these cars, I always say, do you want a Spider or, or a Coupe? And, the, and the, the, the mentality of supercar owners is that a spider is not really a genuine supercar. It's a hairdresser yeah. version. And I said, I've driven off these cars. There is no difference, rigidity, between a spider and a coupe. Yeah. All rigidity of the, of, the, of the McLaren range, the entire range comes from the tub. The roof is there to stop you getting wet. Yeah. It is that big a difference. So a spider is exactly the same handling, exactly the same performance, exactly the same uh, as, as a coupe would be. So, the, so it is really two cars. It's clever as well, that spider, isn't it? Because it's that, that hard, hard roof and it all sort of, Folds nicely away. You know, again, something we've probably done work on maybe two in 10 years, really? uh, and that's just gone out of alignment, so it's very rarely a problem. And arguably, the roof on the 12C is better than the 720. It's certainly faster. 
Is it and it's really? quicker to up and down the 720 by speed, but in terms of the actual function the in and out, it's the same. But in terms of the, 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 the so example, I can happily have a roof down a 12C, have a conversation with my passenger at 100 mile an hour. Yeah. Okay, you can't do more than 80 mile an hour 720, it's much louder. Right. Um, so the design of the first one, they couldn't get any better with that. That's primarily because also the 720 sucks air into the, into the in engine intake. Yeah. Uh, but again, they're very reliable, they don't go wrong. Um, it, it's, it's a good thing to have. Yeah. We've got the engine cover up, up here, and we've got uh, obviously the, the gallery view into that. It's a very tidy package, that, isn't it? Well, yeah. <laughs> the downside, I guess, for McLaren's is that you don't have that um, Ferrari in your face. Yeah. I mean, you look at any of the Ferraris and the mid engine engines, they go, here's my engine, it screams engine at you. Yeah. You can't really accuse McLaren of that. It's far more subtle. No, it's, it's covered with lots, of, lots yes. of bits of plastic over it. And they are being unfair. The engine is a nice, pretty engine, but it's, mm. a, it's a twin turbo V8. Okay, look at Chevy V8s for how pretty an engine could be. I wouldn't describe it as a pretty engine. Yeah. It's a very sophisticated engine, and it's, very, it's won every award under the sun. But is it something that you want to show off to people? Probably not. Yeah. Um, so it, there's a bit less drama back here you can do. Uh, so, I mean, are these, are these okay? Because, you know, on some, I've spoken to some Ferrari owners uh, about sort of having, having glass about people slam them and they... They can shatter, can't Again, they? Same thing. I don't, I, we have never replaced any glass panel on any McLaren, yeah. and that includes a 675 that caught fire. Yeah. And even then, the glass didn't break. Oh, really? I mean, granted, the owner put it out pretty quick, yeah. but we expected that glass to shatter, yeah. and, and we actually managed to clean them out and reuse it, so yeah. it didn't get thrown away at all. And visibility good out the, out the back of, of these, or is it kind of... Well, that's one of the benefits, really. When you get in a McLaren, it doesn't matter what model, a 12 specifically, it shrinks around you. I mean, I have a Lamborghini, and they're big cars. I mean, they, even though they may not be as big on the road as you think, you feel you're in a big car. Yeah. And these are different. You shrink around you, so your visibility is very good. Yeah. You, can act, you can see through the rear window. Now, granted, when the air brake goes up, it pops up, that's you can't nice. see a thing, <laughs> but that's part of the drama of the car. Um, they really are quite a compact car in that regard. And visibility, I mean, they all have parking sensors. You, you can despec them, um, but you don't really need to use them. Yeah. If you do, then you're probably a bit, bit, bit less concerned about your parking route than I normally am. <laughs> Um, but but what should we what should we be? Con I mean, other than you, you're saying we said earlier on, sort of checking the oil and and um, those hose clips and things like that. What else should we be concerned about? What well, it's a good doing? example. From the top of the engine, you can't really see anything. There really is very little you can see. All the work goes from underneath, which is why you need a ramp to see these things. Yeah. You can see one of the hose clips here that we've replaced. That top one there. Yeah. That's a motorsport clip. Yeah. That's one we had a normal little clip would go wrong. You've also got this called the intake sound generator. It's that little black thing there. That can fail, and it gives like a turkey noise when it fails, basically a diaphragm inside. But from the top of the engine, you can't really see too much. No. Everything goes on from underneath. Yep. Um, things like air brakes, um, they're very rare to fail, um, but they can be, I mean, we did a video on our own YouTube site. We do a, a, on our YouTube site lots of technical features to help yes. people. One of the ones is sometimes the sensors go out of alignment, and otherwise it'd be into a dealer to fix it. And what we figured out very early on was that you basically turn the engine off, turn the ignition off, you can physically manipulate the wing pump it a few times, it resets the sensors. So it's a 30 oh, right. second fix with yeah. otherwise into a dealer and replacing it. So manipulating that doesn't affect, doesn't no. affect the motors or anything like no, that? Not no. at all, not at all. I mean, it's pretty, the first time you do it, you think you're going to break it, because yeah. you think, oh, I've got to break it, and it's not, it's, it's yeah. pretty solid. Um, but yeah, so, so from the top of the side, you can't really see too much, which is why we always say for inspections for people, it's all underneath. And of course, there's flat floor under trays in there. So if you put this ramp now, you look, oh yeah, great, big flat floor, I can't see a thing. They have to come down, because behind that, you yeah. see where the issue's going to be is the answer but top some of that. So air brakes worth checking. Again, easy way of doing that on a road test is hit the brakes. Yeah. It'll pop up two different levels, hard braking, full level. Another thing to do when you full acceleration, it'll flatten down. Yeah. So on full acceleration, hard hit, flattens under give it aero mode, and on braking, it goes up two different levels from there. Um, obviously, with a diagnostic kit we can do, we can do an air brake activation test, which basically goes to motion and flapping about, which is quite fun to video, but <laughs> not even you can do. It. Yes. Yeah. Um, but again, very rare failure. Um, and if they, you can be fixed, just simply there with the unit just basically manipulating it. Yeah. Good to know. Sports exhaust worth having. Um, so again, you can't see the exhaust. It's all covered up. And you can yeah. tell by the noise of it. We do a lot of, we do custom built exhausts here. So the sports exhaust is okay. It's better than nothing, but really it's still quite quiet because of that twin turbo configuration. So we can make them a lot louder. Um, and we give like a Formula One noise, very high pitch, which is great. Yeah, but we're not going to make one sound like a like a, a, a V12 or a V10 Lambo or something. It does not work that way. No. Not, not on these sort of cars. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work, does it? Fantastic. Well, be good, good to hear it and uh, see it out on the road if we can. So um, maybe we'll maybe we'll go and do that. But thank you for taking us around and that's and, right. Uh, Hope it's useful. Showing us showing us a few things that we should be looking at. We'll get your top five tips for uh, for a little uh, social short to encourage people to watch this. But um, thank you for your time. That's right.
Nice yeah, to meet you. So, thank you. So would a 12C make it onto your consideration list or do you think you'd still prefer something Italian? If so, check out our Ferrari buyer's guide here. Be sure to take a look at the latest global listings on collectingcars.com.